discussion we're going to talk about one of the most groundbreaking eschatologies in the last few decades one which really took insight from previous both academic and popular versions and in really the reflections of 40 years of thinking on both the biblical historical and theological themes of eschatology and Jürgen Moltmann's coming of God really is a, in many ways, a recovery of a kind of proactive eschatology that has both implications for the past and the future. He's not having to choose between the two. He's not having to choose between the academic and the pastoral, but rather in understanding how eschatology really is a holistic vision for all of creation and really is a doctrine that reaches into every part of life and every theological discussion. He's offering a more fully developed eschatology than really hardly anyone else has done. And so in focusing on him and then in the next unit focusing on Pannenberg, I'm not emphasizing European theology as somehow being this premier only resource. Rather, I'm looking at both Moltmann and Pannenberg as bridges of sorts. They are taking the massive discussions of eschatology in its many forms in the past and pointing to ways in which the global community can think differently about eschatology than what has been handed down by other uh, resources. So often eschatology becomes an idealized anthropology or a empty promise towards earthly success or a pie in the sky promise towards some kind of later version of uh, salvation but to ignore the moment. And both Pannenberg and, and Moltmann are what's called theologians of hope. And hope is a defining category for both of them because eschatology is itself the expression, the body of hope that we are looking toward. And now how does that reach back into our lives? And so in focusing on Moltmann and then also on some individual eschatology and next on Pannenberg and also some cosmic es es eschatology, I'm wanting to orient how broadly eschatology is important for our daily pastoral lives, for our the diversity of congregations, a way of bringing together voices from around the world. And in understanding these two and the, the immense impact they've had on theologians throughout the world, you'll be on strong footing for both your own constructive engagement and also understanding the turns and twists that are continuing to be developed, not only in Europe or North America, but also around the world. By any account, as I said, Moltmann has offered one of the most important eschatological proposals in the 20th century, which is titled The Coming of God. Now, Theology of Hope, which is his first major work, is significantly more well-known, significantly more well-read. But in a sense, that is eschatology from an anthropological perspective. It's emphasizing how eschatology orients us in hope and why it is a guiding narrative for, for who we are and what we do. And it was an important proposal about renewing the vision of the kingdom of God as part of our own continued theological task. Coming of God is more developed. It's also more ambitious. In some respects, it's eschatology from a divine perspective, including human life, but trying to encompass the fullness of God's revelation in scripture and the reflection on this more broadly and trying to come to terms with how this all fits together for a renewed vision for the future, not just for our own experience of life, but for all of creation. The title for his popular version, so a lot of his books, especially his later books, had a, a major uh, thick dense in which he goes through a lot of the conversations and develops and shows his work and a lot. But, but he also has these companion volumes that I call them and that, that tend to be more pastoral, that tend to be more worshipful, though his major works do certainly get into that kind of prayer and worship on occasion, which makes them fun reading. But they're also tending to, to 
boil it down to what is his key points and arguments and offer sort of this direction for how this can apply. So most of the time, except for those who are more into intense theological reading or are wanting to develop their understanding of Montmont more deeply, I recommend starting with these companion volumes. Eschatology became the leading theme of his Theology of Hope in his first main book, as I said, which was originally titled Theology of Hope on the Ground and the Implications of a Christian Eschatology. He lamented in this book the lack of eschatological orientation and turned to hope in Christian theology via view the future orientation of secular philosophy, such as Ernst Bloch and his principle of hope. Now, some have criticized Moltmann for taking Bloch, who, is, who was an avowed Marxist, and really baptizing in a printing Christian theme. And, and that's really not true. I mean, that, that was Bart's charge for Moltmann. It really isn't true. What Moltmann did is read Bloch's work and realized that hope was such an integrated part of scriptural theology, and it seemed very weird that that we were handing off the discussion of hope to these other philosophers. So he used that as a launching pad and certainly a conversation partner, but in doing that, he, he really filled it more with a Christian theme that had been lost and forgotten and, oft, and far too often ignored. Moltmann became known as the main advocate of the theology of hope, which turns to the future as the main locus of the doctrine of God and Christian salvation. The term eschatological ontology, which is often applied to him and Moltmann, means that it is the future rather than the past or the present, which is ontologically primary. And so that has to be the focus of theology and focus of our being and hope. We don't focus on the past to give us meaning. We focus on the future. Not Again, not some pie in the sky vague thing, but the future of God's victory, which has already been foretold to us so that in orienting towards this future, we stay aligned with God's continuing mission in our present, and that is a redemptive experience of our past. So he began to speak of theology as eschatology. Theology, ultimately, if we're going to talk about God, is eschatological. In this outlook, eschatology is not a chapter, let alone a side thought or afterthought in systematic theology, but rather its first chapter. Indeed, all of theology is eschatologically driven. Several theological themes speak for the importance of eschatological orientation. God's revelation is primarily one of promise. Revelation is less about unveiling something mysterious and more about a pledge, an assurance of faithfulness in the future. This faithfulness encompasses all of life, including Christ's resurrection as a culmination of God's promises and the pledge of the faithfulness of God to his promises. This is really extending the archetype of the Exodus narrative into an even more cosmic sense, and that's how scripture does it. You have archetypical stories that that in a, on various scales are, ver, are self-similar. And in being self-similar, you start seeing how these very similar versions can operate on an interpersonal scale or a national community scale or in a cosmic scale. And so history itself brings this together. He writes on page 17, and I'm going to be doing a lot of quotes in this version as a way of giving you some direct insight into his voice and letting him speak for himself, knowing that most of you won't be engaging his text. So this is going to be more quote heavy than my usual discussions. He, on page 17, he writes, Christian eschatology does not speak of a future as such. Christian eschatology speaks of Jesus Christ and his future. Hence, the question whether all statements about the future are grounded in the person and history of Jesus Christ provides it with a touchstone by which to distinguish the spirit of eschatology from that of utopia. Now, what do we mean by this? So often in a lot of Christian movements, whether conservative or progressive or good on the list, it is thought that Jesus gives people a set of goals. Here is the goal of justice. Here is the goal of help. Here is the goal of salvation. Here is the goal of evangelism. So often people take these goals and then incorporate them in sort of a general sense, and Jesus himself is, if not extraneous, at least sort of on the on the outskirts, watching, making sure people do it right. He's sort of the supervisor, right, of making sure that people get these things done right. And so we have the content of theology is often used orthodoxy to have the right beliefs or orthopraxy to do the right things. And it is seen as pursuit of these goals itself is the way to honor God. 
that is missing what scripture really is emphasizing. The biblical justice is not this broad general understanding of justice that is carried out by any nation and God just sort of applauds those who are doing right. Biblical justice is always oriented in a divine relationship with God. And in Christianity, this divine relationship is oriented in Jesus Christ. So that the whole package of Christian teaching, the whole package of Christian ethics, the whole passion, uh, the, the whole package of Christian experience is oriented in and through Jesus. We await Jesus, and it is only in and through Jesus that we can experience the kind of orienting lifestyle, the orienting beliefs, the orienting experiences that actually have all these other things fall into shape. So Jesus isn't a side player. He is actually the orienting goal. We seek Jesus. It, Christian theology, sees in the resurrection of Christ not the eternity of heaven, but the future of the very earth on which his cross stands. It seems in him the future of the very humanity for which he died. And this is expanding on that. It's, it, when we say the goal is Jesus, we're not dismissing the idea of justice or helps or all those other things that some early fundamentalists started thinking that, well, we don't have to help people because all they need is salvation. Well, well, that's creating a content rather than a, a, a target that isn't Jesus. When we say the, the path and the goal of Christian eschatology is Jesus, this experience of Jesus, it is saying that only through Jesus does all those other things fall into shape most fully with integrity and coherence. Those things are part and parcel of experiencing Christ. They're not separate parts, but they also are able to be achieved outside of the experience of Christ. The focus and outline of The Coming of God, the book, there's four layers of Christian eschatology. One, there's a personal eschatology in which we ask and God reveals what will become of me. There's a historical eschatology. What will become of history? And this includes the question, how do we understand history? A cosmic eschatology. What will become of the whole creation, all that's been made, the whole universe. And then a divine eschatology, which is Maltmont and his most daring. What will become of God? And each of these questions is dependent on the idea that they are driving questions for how we are trying to navigate life, but also questions that the Bible itself seems to address. So we can't ignore one for the other. We can't say, well, we're only going to focus on cosmic and leave out historical, or per we're going to focus on personal because that's what our experience of life and not focus on the divine. Yes, there's some areas that we're closer and we can add our own input to, but there's also those areas in which we can be most deceived by. And so each of these four are ways in which scripture talks about the future of God's work. And future itself is a tricky word. We, we talk about eschatology being future as ahead of us in terms of the temporal line. For God, there is no past, present, and future in this linear experience of life. God experiences reality and its fullness and gathers together all time. So what, what we say is our future is God's experience. Some key initial concepts that he begins with. Front one, Advent. The coming of God, this, there's this new beginning, the parousia, the manifestation, the coming, this initiation of work in the world, God is entering into the world and there's a starting point for this. Eschatology is not a speculation into the future about which we, after all, know very little, but rather it's the coming of God to redeem creation and find his resting place in the redeemed cosmos. And we see these initiating movements through scripture. We see God interacting with Moses and beginning the narrative of Israel with Abraham. We see his initiating contact with the prophets and the kings. And of course, the, the most grand is God entering into this world because he loved it so much in the person of the son. This entry, this coming, this newness is itself a new thing. And there's a novum, there's something new about this. Eschatological hope, as said, is not only or primarily about what will happen about the, in the future, but about this new thing, this thing that can't be predicted, this thing that can't be a, a part of what has gone before, what God is doing and will be doing in this world. Therefore, history and nature, creation will be renewed. It is this worldly hope rather than a utopia that God is having us oriented towards. Novum, he writes, is the historical side of the messianic people, the eschatological openness to the future. For behold, Isaiah says, 
I purpose to do a new thing. Are you ready? Are you waiting for this new thing? Are you expectant for this new thing? It's not just something that happens out of all the things that are prepared. It's God doing something new for the purposes of his mission and for the blessing of this world. Let's let's go through each of these. Again, really briefly, I have some longer versions of, of some of the more detailed discussions in a separate section that I'm not including in this discussion, but this is really more of an orientation of his overall project. So let's talk about personal eschatology and the theology of death. Death is so terrible because of love. We fear to be separated from those we love and the life we love. Christians are supposed to love rather than hate love, rather than hate life. We're supposed to love life. So what does it mean to love life? That means death is an enemy. Death is something that we are both mad at and sad about because whenever there is separation, we have an angst about the separation. This is something one one discussion of hell calls it this eternal separation. So death, really, when we're separated from those we have loved and those we love and those we care for and who've cared for us, we experience this little taste of hell in that moment. Love makes us vulnerable to pain, mourning, and death. It is because we love that we mourn. It is because we love that we feel torn up by the suffering and pain and death of others. And this brings in the importance of hope for the resurrection of the body. It's not this pagan idea of the immortality of soul, which is so common in my church experience. Like you, your soul gets saved and your soul goes to heaven. Well, that's not really Christian. What is Christian is the resurrection of the body. And what, what we, when we talk about the resurrection of the body, we're talking about the resurrection, this renewal of actually who we are. Now, we were going to take on a kind of newness. Christ is the firstborn from the dead in this new kind of experience of life. But he's still Jesus. He, he was still the person he, that others knew, even though there was something more <laughs> to him. And so with us, all that we are, who we are in our essence, which combines our mental and physical and spiritual and all this part will itself be part of this renewal and be back in companionship. So there's a continuity in God's creative work. God will redeem what he has created. He doesn't get rid of it and start over. He renews it. Christ's resurrection then is the ground of hope for our resurrection. Do we have hope in God? Well, Jesus forged the way. Can we trust in Jesus? There are witnesses who said they saw him. They talked to him. They ate with him. This is our journey then. These witnesses give us the kernel of the gospel that orient us in hope. What is this hope that we too are going to be participants in this promise? The key questions to a personal eschatology are the relationship between death and sin. How is it that death and sin are related? How is it that sin in, in both a grand sense and death in its most grand general sense are oriented in God's redemptive work? How do these connect? And also, but how, how, how does sin and death working in our own life? How does our dying and our sin then become redeemed in the, in the context of God's ultimate victory. Another question, where are the dead? So we have not experienced Jesus's return, but many millions and millions of people have already died. What is their experience right now? And I'm not going to give the answers to those questions. Those are just the key questions, right? Those are the, the some key orienting questions toward a personal eschatology that will that will continue to shape both Maltman's discussion and our own journey in these things. And and by acknowledging those, really, it's it's a way of saying those those are good questions to ask. And a lot of people have those questions. And sometimes in some theologies, they say, "Here's the list of questions you're allowed to ask." Well, in this case, it's really of all these different categories really allow for each question to find its own space and its own place of conversation. So let's talk about historical eschatology, which includes the kingdom of God and the millennium. This is the biggest section of the coming of God, telling us how important history is for Moltmann's understanding of Christian hope. He writes on page 132, so with historical eschatology, we find ourselves in the middle between personal hope and cosmic expectations. Unlike most mainline theologians, most theologians in general, except outside of very conservative ones, Moltmann actually talks a lot about the millennium. He, he understands the importance of this idea in both scripture and in church history and realizes that we can't just leave this out of discussions because it may be confusing or it may have been developed by others. So he regards this millennial hope, that the establishment of God's kingdom on this earth, as vital to Christian faith. It's not just something he's going to say, let's talk about this and then we'll move on to the more important things. He actually sees this as key to the whole enterprise. Millennium is transition from history to eschatology to new creation. 
He writes, the millenarian expectation mediates between world history here and the end of the world there. It makes the end as transition possible. In some sense, it's a little bit how like scenes in a movie do have transitions where where there's there's a kind of an effect where it's both one scene and the other scene. And there's an effect that blurs or gathers or does something to bring them both together so that it's not like an instant stop and then start. There's a there's a time. There's an experience in which there's a mingling of, of both. And it is this millennium that offers that ability to transition from our current experience of life to the eternal life without having some kind of sudden shift that might break us in half, right? However, Moma makes a sharp distinction between two kinds of millennial hopes, namely the historical and eschatological millenarianism. Historical millenarianism, which is he writes the millenarian interpretation of the present in its political or ecclesiastical aspect or in the context of universal history has three forms. One, political millenarianism, which includes the kind of redeemer nation. And this is sort of the, the, the group of people who within the context of time are offering this pointed vision to and hope for other nations to follow. Israel had this role, certainly we read in the Old Testament. The idea of a particular nation being the savior of the world. What has to be taken seriously, he writes, is the United States' strange millenarian mythology because it has a genuine basis. And this is an interesting thing for a, a theologian to say and 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 depending on where you are on in many discussions may actually be a little wrinkling because here Moltmann does an interesting turn and and embraces some of what we now, now see as very conservative under uh, instinct of like somehow the United States being the beacon but what he argues and historically this has a, and even contemporary this has a strong basis there really is something about the narrative of the United States in its hoped for vision not always is not always in its history of course i'm not negating that and Moltmann by no means negates the problematic history but there's something of the hope that have caused people to journey from their location and their part of the world to find a new beginning here well what is that vision that they have that they're being given if america has been chosen for the salvation of all nations and humanity in general then its policies not only can but must be measured against their promotion of the liberty of other peoples, the self-government of these peoples, and their human rights. Politically, humanity cannot afford more than one America, and the same can be said of ecologically of the earth. And this is where he embeds the idea of responsibility. If there is an aspect of the United States that has this element of hope and a beacon in part, in, in sort of this, this idea of promise, it also carries a deep responsibility. And then this responsibility can be used as a source of critique against it. You say you want to be this nation, well, you have to live up then and, and be obligated in a way that others may not have to be. There's a responsibility to this, but there's also this responsibility that this cannot be something where we are isolated in contrast to other nations, but the very nature of this kind of experience is one that has to include empowering and enlivening others and exploring what it means to live a balanced life. When we talked very early on in this in discussion about the difference between modern and postmodern theologies, I emphasized how the modern era really saw itself over and against nature, over and against the world, over and of, of against. It's always it's over and against the other in, in a kind of competition. Whereas postmodernism argues that, that that is the way of destruction, of exhausting resources. And this is what Moltmann's point is. The kind of resource hog that he sees in the United States cannot be sustained by every nation because the world is not capable of, of handling that much absorption, absorption of excess. So there is a learning aspect of this uh, that seeks to find moderation and encourages a new kind of discovery together about what it means to be human, offering a bounty, but also in listening to others and empowering others in their speaking into what it means to live life in this world. Moltmann continues by talking about ecclesiastical millenarianism. Titles the mother and preceptress of the nations. Is the church really triumphant? The idea of the church being the savior. It is not the holy empire that brings salvation to the nations. It is the holy church. The church is the millennium. 
It no longer participates in the struggle and sufferings of Christ, but already judges and reigns with him in his kingdom. And this was certainly an expression of the early church. After Constantine, the church really saw the empire as a role, but really the church taking a lead. But even more so in the medieval era, the Bishop of Rome, the Pope, becomes sort of the kingmaker and, in, and the leader of the many nations, even though those many nations may be warring. And while it's been mostly left behind, there is still echoes of this in some approaches to theology that sees the church as equivalent to the kingdom, as the church the sign of the of the kingdom, or the, the church as a model to the kingdom. And this is where we, you, you don't have exactly the same kind of millennium kind of language. But you do get a kind of idealized version of the church and an idealized version of e ecclesiastical authority or theologian's authority, <laughs> depending on where you, you place the authority and expression of what makes the church the church. You can also look at epical millenarianism, the birth of modern times out of the spirit of messianic hope. And this is where we come back a little bit to Hegel. The idea of a certain time period, such as the enlightenment being the culmination of human hopes. Waltman writes, the kingdom of God is coming, but it will not be the result of the apocalyptic revolution brought about by God. It will come through the growth of reason and morality among human beings. It will have no effect on natural life, but will take place exclusively in the life of the human being. Now, again, the, we, we can criticize criticize Hegel and others, but there's also forms of this now, especially in the way that the political and moral discussions have become so intertwined that there is a kind of ethical mandate about how you vote. And there's this sense that if we just vote right or that we institute the right rules, that we're going to finally have this idealized version in which everyone gets along and all the promises of the millennium can take shape in the yearnings and hearts of if people just got all the old tradition out of the way and we just started to live together again. But of course the problem is uh, that as idealized as it is in some scope, and, and it's a good goal, it's not wrong to work towards good things. But when we see what happens when people actually start organizing themselves anew, you, you don't have this like all of a sudden humanity is healed. You have the same old problems. I was reminded the other day of someone uh, online and said, well, if we just were able to start off all new and we're able to get uh, a new start and, and not have to deal with the, the problems and histories and we could throw that out and just say, well, knowing what we know now, let's start anew. And in, in many ways, that's exactly what social media was about 15 to 10, 15 years ago, we actually had this new chance to start a new kind of social experience afresh, where we didn't have the same kind of limitations and the same kind of barriers, and the internet was this kind of open field. And what happens? Well, we realize that social media and the internet ha is not separate from our human condition, but in fact resonates and exemplifies and gives even more freedom to our dysfunctional interactions. The negative effect of historical millenarianism is that it is a religious theory used to legitimate political or ecclesiastical power and is exposed to acts of messianic violence and the disappointments of history. And that is a reflection on the past and a warning to present versions which, which are seeking to impose new idealized expressions as if, if we just were able to overthrow our enemies or push past those who are wrong thinkers, we're going to get a right kind of model. And that is dangerous because it makes Christ into a symbol. It makes Christ into a giver of goals, but it doesn't make Christ as the source. And this puts then the burden on an idealized anthropology. Momon then turns to eschatological millenarianism. This is the Christian or biblical form of millenarianism. It is based on a redemption brought about by God. He writes, eschatological millenarianism is an expectation of the future in the eschatological context of the end and the new creation of the world. So rather than being oriented in light of being given some goals and then us being in charge of putting it into place or using the systems of the world as they are to fulfill this bigger mandate and thus letting one of these systems dominate and become essentially our Lord. 
This is really orienting within the theme of scripture, which is the idea that it is God whose intervention and work and transformation is our hope. Rather than leading to violence, it becomes an ethical incentive and power for suffering and resistance. He writes, eschatological millenarianism is a necessary picture of hope and resistance in suffering and in the exiles of this world. Now, when we talk about leading to violence, a, a quick critique of this would be, well, how, how we certainly see violence in in the church history and other things. And that's exactly a right critique because whenever we see violence or we see a kind of earthly impatience or any of the negative critiques, it's almost always, I would say always, but it's always good to be a little humble. It's its almost always a sign that, that Christianity has been co-opted by one of the other systems. So where does Christian violence start in the early church? Well, it starts when it became a, a kind of empire after Constantine, which isn't to blame Constantine, but that's a longer discussion. And or later in the medieval church, it became when ecclesiastical empire became the, the topic. Or later on in the Enlightenment, when this theory of human advancement became the model. And so you have things like the French Revolution, which wanted to slaughter all the, the people who were seen as being in the way, or, or even today where the violence isn't as always physical, but it is a, a, an emotional and social kind of violence that we take out against people because we're seeing the hope in within another system. But we, even if we use Christian language, the Christian hope has been co-opted and thus it is not truly eschatological. Having laid out this view of the millennium, Moltmann takes up an issue widely debated in history and contemporary theology, namely judgment. He presents the controversial idea as, of judgment as cleansing, which leads to a restoration of all things rather than a separation between the good and evil. And in this sense, he has, has what we might call a, an approach to sin more like Irenaeus, where there's a, there, there's a maturing, but then judgment becomes a, a, a time of separation, but not separation in an eternal sense, but separation so that it's, it's more like a time out right than an eternal judgment like okay you need to go to your room for a little bit or you need to have this punishment but it is meant to be restorative judgment for Moltmann is not about making distinction between the good and evil but a rather a process of cleansing and purification well why so well Moltmann responds he writes behind this question is the question about God does God as the creator go with all his created beings into life death and resurrection or does God, as judge, stand over against those he has created, detached and uninvolved, to pardon or condemn? Well, the answer, of course, is that he goes into life, death, and resurrection. So that creates an interesting distinction for him. He continues, does theology not involve the Christian faith in inward contradictions if what is expected of the great judgment is something different from what God has revealed in Israel's history and the history of Jesus Christ? In light of that, so subsequently, out of those questions, Moltmann is drawn to the idea that at the end of all things, there is a restoration of all things. The classical Christian doctrine of apocatastasis, the restoration of all back into relationship with God. Moltmann argues that the Bible presents arguments both for and against universalism, and therefore the issue cannot be settled biblically alone. A systematic theological reasoning, reasoning is needed. Now here is not Moltmann dismissing the Bible out of hand or just trying to impose his own rule, or talking about universalism in sort of the wishy-washy way that some earlier versions of liberal theology or, or contemporary forms of more mass religion have done. Really, is what he's arguing is that because the Bible has so many different audiences in mind, to given the different writings, the idea that, that eschatology is never written in a vacuum as sort of this stock story but is always meant for a specific kind of listener in each setting and that because of that you have passages that relate to God bringing all things back into the communion God wanting all to be saved and you also have passages of judgment he says in light of that you have to navigate the tensions that we see within scripture and come to terms with the, with the broader message of scripture which is that God loves that God seeks all to be saved 
saved. And thus, if God seeks all to be saved, as God, God gets what he wants. So he deals carefully in his discussion with typical objections to universalism, or the, the, the better way of saying the restoration of all things as well as arguments for him. Universalism is often used as a, it doesn't matter what you believe and everyone is getting to heaven. And that's not really, really what Moltmann is saying. He's not saying that it doesn't matter what you do or it doesn't matter what you believe. He's really what, he, he's putting the responsibility on God. He's saying it's not human ability that gives possibility. It's not human work, but that this is God's work. Then that he has often said in, in various quotes, it's, it's not what the atheist believes that matters. It's what God believes. And so here, his version of universalism, which I get into in, in, in another course more specifically, is really a way of saying God gets what he wants. God is the one in charge. And, and this really reflects his very reformed kind of emphasis on the sovereignty of God. He's rejecting the idea that humanity in any sense has the ability to choose this eternal destination that because it precisely reflects the the grand mission of God. Here is his conclusion. Judgment, he writes, is the righteousness and justice of the God of Abraham, the father of Jesus Christ, who creates justice, puts things to right, and justifies. This means that the eschatological last judgment is not a prototype for the courts of kingdoms or empires. This judgment has to do with God and his creative justice and is quite different from the forms our earthly justice take. We, what we call the last judgment is nothing other than the universal revelation of Jesus Christ and the consummation of re, his redemptive work. And his redemptive work is about restoration and reconciliation. He continues boldly, no expiatory penal code will be applied in the court of the crucified Christ. No punishments of eternal death will be imposed. The final spread of the divine righteousness that creates justice serves the eternal kingdom of God, not the final restoration of a divine world order that has been infringed. Judgment at the end is not an end at all. It is the beginning. Its goal is the restoration of all things for the building up of God's eternal kingdom. What do we do with hell? Clearly, hell has been talked about. Most universalists deny hell. They don't. They don't like the existence of hell. In fact, the the idea of hell is what drives a lot of people towards a form of universalism. Moltmann does not deny hell. He actually acknowledges and says this is a very real expression and experience and reality. But he interprets it Christologically. He writes, The Christian doctrine about the restoration of all things denies neither damnation nor hell. On the contrary, it assumes that in his suffering and dying, Christ suffered the true and total hell of God forsakenness for the reconciliation of the world. And he experienced for us the true and total damnation of sin. It is precisely here that the divine reason for the reconciliation of the universe is to be found. And this is where Moltmann really digs into the creedal statement that Jesus descended to the dead, or, or in other words, phrasing this, descended into hell. It's that Jesus actually went into hell, and the power of Jesus broke down the gates of hell so that it can't hold anyone. Therefore, ex salvation extends to all. He writes, in the divine judgment, all sinners, the wicked and the violent, the murderers and the children of Satan, the devil and fallen angels will be liberated and saved from their deadly perdition through the transformation into their true created being. Because God remains true to himself and does not give up what he has once created and affirmed or allowed. So let's turn to cosmic es eschatology. Now that in that previous version, there's a, there's a lot there. And this is where I, I am. Even as I speak, I'm very cautious and having a lot of thoughts go through my head about, oh, oh, I need to talk about this or I need to talk about that. Because it's worth not dismissing Moltmann here altogether. And, and I will admit that I have, this is where I struggle with Moltmann's conclusions, even though I love his reasoning here and I appreciate it and I've learned from it. I think the Bible does talk more about judgment and the separation. And we do see Jesus allowing people to walk away without that being a failure of his mission. And I, and so I I think the biblical, biblical testimony is a little bit more clear than Moltmann allows. But that said, I very much appreciate how he's taking an attribute of God, a revelation of God, a, and distinct verses of God, and really applying these to a consistent way so that, it, so, so that the teachings on last judgment has more coherence.
But he also, I want to add, because I don't know if I get into this later on, is that he also deals with an admission that there is a kind of eternal judgment, but that there's not just one eternity. And this is where his, his work really digs into some of the more advanced understanding of time and space, where you can have aeonic time which has multiple versions, multiple expressions of eternity. So you can be eternally damned, but that's not for all eternities. <laughs> now, if this is, sounds very complicated or, or he's trying to dodge the issue, um, it is complicated, but he's not actually trying to dodge the issue. He's actually trying to engage the broader understanding of both biblical teaching, systematic thought, and include with this contemporary understandings of time that have have really caused us to shift our understanding of what the universe inherently is. With all that in mind, since I've already clicked on it, let's turn to cosmic eschatology. And here he emphasizes Sabbath and Shekinah. Moltmann speaks of the physicality of Christian hope, and therefore personal and historical eschatology is not enough. He writes, Christian eschatology must be broadened out into cosmic eschatology, for otherwise it becomes a Gnostic do doctrine of redemption, and is bound to teach no longer the redemption of the world, but a redemption from the world. No longer the redemption of the body, but a deliverance of the soul from the body. And this is where he, in these contrasts, he's really critiquing a lot of popular forms of end times, which talks about deliverance of the soul from the body, which really emphasizes the redemption from the world. And his, what, what I really agree with is his rightly understood doctrine of scripture here says, no, God so loves the cosmos, the world, and that, and he, this is a recreation and it's, and the resurrection is a physicality. And so a lot of the popular forms of our own what might otherwise be considered a very conservative embrace of Christian doctrine actually tend to teach a very kind of heretical form of Gnosticism. Ouch! Here, in talking about this, he envisions the future of the redeemed creation and cosmos in terms of two biblical concepts that he reinterprets and expands but in really in tune with the way scripture does it. He talks about Sabbath and Shekinah. Creation is a process which culminates in the day of Sabbath, completion and rest. Therefore, creation is a system open to the future. Time is projected towards the future. And Momot isn't new here. The idea of there being a great Sabbath, it, it really goes back into early church history and extends into some of the great thinkers throughout history. And oftentimes, the Sabbath was called the eighth day. It's the day beyond our experience of time, but it's the day of promise, the day in which we all rest, all of creation rests. And then we can see in scripture how this the scales across uh, uh, different kinds of levels of reality. So you have the Sabbath being one day a week, but you also have the Sabbath of Sabbaths, right? Every seven years, and then the Jubilee, uh, every seven sevens. And so you can have this kind of scale, self-similarity across scale, that extends what even we read within the law. But then if that is true there, then it seems to have a cosmic implication. In that sense, the end is much more than the beginning because while god is always present to creation it, again his view his view of panentheism which is god is present in and with the world but he's not equivalent to the world but certainly god isn't out to, and fully separate from the world so he has this understanding and he's defining panentheism in a different way than how that term's often used if you look it up so it's important to understand his fully trinitarian engagement with the persons of the Trinity, especially his strongly developed pneumatology, which adds a very orthodox uh, approach. So God is always present to creation, but in the eschatological coming of God, God is present to the community of creation in a more intense way. He writes, the weekly Sabbath with a Sabbath year is God's homeless Shekinah in the time of exile from Jerusalem and in the far country of this world, estranged from God. The eschatological Shekinah, God's presence, his, his, his glory, is the perfected Sabbath in the spaces of the world. Sabbath and Shekinah are related to each other as promise and fulfillment, beginning and completion. Therefore, 
Rather than annihilating the world as in an apocalyptic visions of the end, God is going to transform and help consummate the cosmos. Then will the biblical promise of 1 Corinthians 15.28 be fulfilled, which says, When all things are subjected to him, then the Son himself will also be subjected to the one who put all things in subjection under him, so that God may be all in all. God's not going to devastate and destroy the world and then rule over this smoking husk of his creation. No, that is not what God is Lord of. God is the Lord of creation. And his presence resides in communion with that which he has made. That is the promise. That is the hope. Seen in part in some initial self-similar scales. But then it will become fulfilled in its most profound cosmic scale. At the end of all things. If God, he writes, Moltmann writes, is all in all, then the fellowship in God and fellowship in the world are no longer something separate or antithetical. There is then no spiritual knowing of God and enjoyment of him which is not sensory and bodily as well, and no sensory and bodily contemplation and enjoyment of the world which is not also a contemplation and incorporation of God. From this, Moltmann develops his concept of eternity within time, something I alluded to a little bit earlier. This is the completion of history and creation. It's perfecting into the kingdom of glory in which God himself indwells his creation. If God himself appears in his creation, then, then his eternity appears in the time of creation and his omnipresence in creation space. Mind-blowing! Consequently, time shall be no more. It will be gathered up, fulfilled, and transformed through the eternity of the new creation. This is not the same of as the end of time. Rather, God emerges within time and folds time upon itself. Time is the seed in which eternity blossoms. Whew. This is probably stretching everyone's brains as well it probably should, because if we're talking about eternity and talking about God, we're talking about something that is beyond our ability to conceive. And so trying to contain God within the scope of human knowledge has actually been, I think, a great downfall of many discussions about eschatology, because it sees God's work through the lens of what we see as possible in light of our experience of time and space. But what Moltmann does is he really takes and stretches our thinking here to expand beyond what we think is possible because it doesn't fit our experiences, but really is more in keeping with what God is doing in God's perspective of reality. And now one, one analogy I use here is the idea of a balloon, the idea that, that time isn't this thing that is entirely separate, but that our experience of time and space is like God has inflated a balloon. And within this balloon is all of our experience of time and space, And but God is not separate from that. The balloon exists within the bigger reality that is God's presence. But then at the end times, God enters into this balloon and then inverts the balloon so that it's the same texture and space of the balloon, but rather than being caught in on this inside contained within the balloon, now all that is inside is outside. Again, mind blowing. <laughs> he writes, in the Christian understanding of God, God's eternity is something other than the mere negation of temporality. It is, if it is the fullness of creation, creative life, and that's one, I think, better way of understanding eternity, not in terms of duration, but in terms of fullness. This is where Plotinus, the, the Greek philosopher, how he defined eternity, and something Moltmann and Pannenberg both take up. If it is the fullness of creative life, then it is possible to conceive an opening for time in eternity. Because if we are physical beings, we don't somehow become this new kind of divine substance. We still are retaining our humanness, which means there must be some kind of experience of time. But rather than time being limited by duration and loss and all the other things that define time now, time becomes included within the experience of eternity. In heaven, there is aeonic time. On earth, there is transitory time. Aeonic time can be thought of as a time corresponding to the eternity of God, a time without beginning and end, without before and after. 
what one writes. But it's still an experience of movement, of experience, of time. It's sort of, think, think of a song or a dance where you've really been lost in it, where you, it's like all of your fullness is poured into this, and it's like time itself doesn't have a meaning. And, but at the same time, there's a rhythm, and there's a beat, and there's progression, and there's development within the music or the dance. So there's this experience of progression, but it's not progression that is linear. This is a cyclical form of time, never ending, symmetrical. This form of time encompasses the irreversible trend of earthly time. Earthly time is therefore the time of promise, time of faith and hope in which we are looking ahead in light, in light of the linear view. But then the, at the end of all things, only love remains, right, as, as Paul writes. Because having been fulfilled, the promise is now exp expressed in the fullness of love. And love isn't this now emptiness of feeling and sort of this, this loss, but love is the ever-present experience of the fullness of God present with us and the fullness of others in full community. That has an experience of time within it, but not time in the kind of transitory way that we know now. Earthly creation, he writes, exists within the context of passing time. But this earthly time, for its part, belongs within the context of aeonic time, of the invisible world, continually touching it and being touched by it. Again, think of that balloon that is inflated within the context of this bigger space. As a result, he writes, the temporal creation will then become an eternal creation because all created beings will participate in God's eternity. The spatial creation will then become an omnipresent creation because all created beings will participate in God's omnipresence. At the end, the renewed cosmos becomes the cosmic temple, the heavenly Jerusalem, according to the visionary of the book of Revelation. In that temple, the presence of the divine life becomes the inexhaustible source of creaturely life, which thereby becomes the life that is eternal. Finally, his fourth section on divine eschatology, God's experience of eschatology. This is by far the shortest chapter in the book, as if Moltmann would want, not want to speculate too much. But of course, one of the uh, key critiques of Moltmann is that he's already speculated far too much by even digging into this. It, what, even the shortness of this chapter is, is too long for so many because it seems like he's being highly speculative. But this is, I think, Moltmann being willing to be constructive in light of what Revelation has handed on to us. And so it's not wrong to ask these questions or to seek out a better understanding of God's experience. The basic question is this, what is the meaning for God himself of his glorification by human beings and all his creatures. Usually eschatology thinks of the meaning of future for humanity and to a lesser extent for creation. No eschatology has usually asked a question from the perspective of God. And yet this is often a sticking point for, I, I know some people who really have a problem with Christianity and understanding of God because in their view, the idea that God is creating this whole world and has this plan for everyone to bow down and worship, sounds to them very much like a, a divine narcissist or an, a, an absolute ruler who just wants everyone to fawn over them. And that's not, not what God is seeking, even though there's elements of worship here. Traditional theology has talked about the glorification of God as the ultimate end of creation and redemption. Rather than mere self-glorification, however, Moltmann suggests that for God, the meaning of eschatology, and thus his experience, is rather a feast of eternal joy and communion with creatures and creatures. It's not the isolated self-focus, but in worshiping God, we actually become reoriented to be who we are meant to be in light of what creation is meant to be. And this is a togetherness. We are feasting together in the great Sabbath so that God becomes this orienting reality that puts everything else into the right perspective so that we can finally live free to be who we have been made to be. The glory of God, he writes, is a feast of eternal joy, and the Gospels therefore continually compare it with a wedding feast. Creation and its fulfillment in eschaton, he writes, is like a great sun, or a splendid poem, or a wonderful dance of his fantasy, for the communication of his divine plenitude. The laughter of the universe is God's delight. It is the universal Easter laughter. And that is the last paragraph in the book. So this is what he hints his experience of eschatology on, not with fear or pain or discuss anxiety, the universal Easter laughter.
it is a celebration and that I think whatever critiques and frustrations we might have with Maltmo's proposal here, he gets right because that is the theme that ultimately the Bible extends to the readers, extends to the hearers, and celebrates the book of Revelation is wrongly caught up in all the negative and destructive parts, which are elements of it. But that's not how it ends. That's not how the prophets end. That's not how the Psalms celebrate. We have lament. We have destruction and pain. But there is a gathering together and renewal all throughout scripture that is the testimony that God is not vengeful but God is reconciling and recreating and seeking a renewal of all things in and with and for his glory so that all things can finally become right in tune again with what he intends and what he intends is a celebration of love and all that comes with it so some reflections on Moltmann some affirmations and critical reflections from an evangelical perspective. So at first, we'll start with affirmations. His emphasis on rediscovering the role of eschatology and theology and faith, I think, is enormously powerful, both with his theology of hope and then culminating in his, his, his the coming of God. What he does here is he offers a renewed embrace of the bigger vision of eschatology that really got lost in some of the dispensationalists and other forms that focused on the negative and fear and anxiety and the, the version of hell which was meant to scare people into salvation and that became so dominant and even though there are elements of that that are that are true and testifying in scripture it became such a dominant theme that it overshadowed all the other many ways that eschatology is expressed and utilized throughout scripture and Molman really reminds us of who we say we are to be and even though he isn't an evangelical even though he doesn't have the same view of scripture as most of us would hold on to he actually here is calling us back into a better engagement with the whole of scripture in this most important of theological themes his we can embrace and applaud his methodological approach and in terms of his content that he is attempting to bring together the, the wider perspective of biblical, historical, and theological teachings. And in doing that, really find integrity again with the revelation of God and coherence with the broader testimonies that we find that are doing different things in different parts, but there must be a kind of coherence there. His Christological and Trinitarian ramifications that he emphasizes throughout really is itself groundbreaking, that he uniquely is engaged in not only what this eschatology means for us and our results and for the society we're in, get at those people, right? But he really is trying to come to terms with what does eschatology mean Christologically, and if that is above all the testimony of Scripture, because so often we see Jesus as the teller of the future, and then he's the one who's coming back, but then we populate that teaching with all sorts of other things. But in doing that, we actually are distracted from our vision and expression and hope that it is Jesus' presence again. The same Jesus who left is the Jesus is returning. And he embraces the importance of the millennium. And in doing this, he's not completely bypassing the uh, another segment of Christian teaching that is not only new in, in evangelical teachings, but really is expressed throughout Christian history. And so many theologians trying to uh, recover a form of eschatology dismiss this idea. And yet it is present in scripture. And it is also present in teaching and present in the yearning of people who are seeking a better kind of experience of this world and also the reality that we do not have the imagination to conceive of eternity and need a kind of transition. His understanding of the ethical and practical implications of eschatology. And this is here, here where the orthodoxy, the, the thing that so often is the whole content of eschatology from most of my experiences, you have to believe the right things about it. And here's the, the intellectual content, but it ignores what are we supposed to do and how are we supposed to feel. And Molman brings both these ends. I, I, again, going back to his, his ending chapter, uh, paragraph, where he talks about the, the Easter laughter. This is an orthopathy, an experience of joy and love, and those things are the fruit of the Spirit. And our calling to then live out this eschatological calling isn't one about fear or condemnation, 
And, and it's not about us versus them. It's about living into the promise of what God is already initiating. This has ethical, practical, personal, emotional implications. So it includes the social political, not just beyond us, but has a social, how we are to engage the world now. Do we engage the world in light of its, its telling of the story, or do we engage the world in light of God's promise for us? What is our orientation? A Catholic view of eschatology, and Catholic not in a big C, Roman Catholic, but Catholic in terms of the, the church universal, the church that exists throughout the world and throughout time. And here is this comprehensive all-inclusive is, is why I'm emphasizing Moltmann in the next week, Pannenberg, because the way they approach this isn't emphasizing a narrow scope of either history or a certain culture, but is really an inviting kind of understanding that then can be shared, informed by, learned from, include the chorus of the wider teachings throughout history, and then invitation to theologians and men and women throughout the world who are engaging these same narratives in light of their experience of history, in light of their language. And so it opens the door widely to the chorus of the broader Christian narrative to speak into and celebrate together. And he also digs into the relationship between time and eternity. And, and this is where I think he's especially groundbreaking because so often before this, we really were caught into a pre-modern or modern understanding of time, which had a very anthrocentric perspective that time as we experience it is somehow just an extended through eternity. But that's not true at all. And that's not true just in a theological sense. Our understanding of time and, e and eternity is has been radically shaped by our scientific advances and our understanding of time is, as being linear is our relative perspective. It's not a mathematical truth as in terms of a universal constant. And we can, so Moltmann here is really taking advantage of significant scientific advances over the last hundred years to reshape and reassess how we might better understand an experience of reality that is beyond our own. Some critical questions and challenges. So in terms of method, he has a tendency to speculate, and, and here he's taking some leaps and jumps, and he will acknowledge that, that oftentimes his, his, his goal is to provoke more questions, and he is not trying to say, oh, I'm not speculating. He is aware that he's taking a little bit of evidence and a little bit of, in, of, of insight and, and taking and pushing it to its bounds to explore what is done. But I, I would honestly say that's been the hallmark of some of the great Christian theologians. As long as we are not saying what Moltmann says here is now the officially new statement of orthodoxy, and we have to take his statements as absolute gospel, which he himself would sharply resist. But what he's saying is he's trying to get us to think in a new way. Maybe his, his insights are correct, maybe they're not, but the hope is to change the conversation so that we are understanding it in a new way. His selective use of biblical tradition is very clear. He tends to weigh things over against each other. His selective use of historical tradition also does the same thing. He picks and chooses in order to build his case based on what he sees as a hypothesis, the better understanding. And in doing that, he is picking and choosing in, in what may not be an arbitrary way, but he is not necessarily picking and choosing in a way that gathers together the whole of the biblical tradition or the whole of the historical tradition. So he is definitely oriented it within the scope of his own creative and, and constructive hypotheses, which isn't to dismiss it. We all do that. Right? Even the most conservative uh, churches who highlight an errant, errant view, they won't, they won't say, well, we disagree with this part of scripture, but they, there's a lot of passages of scripture that were very ignored in my experience of church. In terms of issues, his, his conversation of panentheism is challenging. And I think this is where how he is interpreted may, may be more distinctive than what he might say. His understanding of panentheism really is, is developed uniquely, but the term itself is used by process theologians to develop in a way that, that many might find troublesome. His universalism is problematic for reasons we already talked about and because the scripture seems to indicate there's a presence of judgment and while God can seek all to be saved, there is an indication that he's not necessarily necessarily going to do that. That seems, that seems related all throughout, and God is okay, as shocking as it seems, with some being lost. The issue of judgment and it is, is one where he's maybe trying to ease the burden of that based on these earlier two. And uh, issue in need of clarification. Uh, how does he talk about millennium? This is still a confusing element of him trying to gather in, and yet still not very clear, and so it may need some further development. And the establishment of justice. When we talk about justice, we, we run into the 
problem of the experience of there's real problems at work. And so we want to have some kind of way where real hurts and pains were addressed in a sense of what we would see as justice, not just washed over. I don't think he does that, but I think the, the inclination is for him is to move too quickly past those real needs and concerns and real problematic elements of history. Inclusion. Why does Moltmann stand out, and how is Moltmann doing something distinct? Well, Moltmann is unique among theologians in how he really does take seriously the idea of a millennium, and in this way really creates a bridge between uh, the, the popular evangelical approach and, and ways which extend this into a more cosmic, and I would argue, holistic approach that takes even more seriously the broader testimony of scripture. Pannenberg, in, in contrast, only br briefly restores this concept. And so while Pannenberg also is doing a lot of very helpful work, he, in, in leaving this out, he really does continue a kind of disconnect. In Pannenberg's conception, millenarianism is an attempt to bridge two views on the resurrection. Pannenberg in volume three of his systematic theory writes, it is clearly meant to make it possible to hold fast to the distinctive Christian hope of salvation by participation in the life that was manifested in the resurrection of Jesus Christ, along with the idea of a universal raising of the dead as a prelude to the last judgment. So for him, it's more of a theological attempt to to provide a path for the listeners and a bridge for them. And so he, he doesn't see this as nearly inherently part of God's overall work. But Moltmann does. Moltmann has a very different goal in his very lengthy examination of millenarian thought, which I briefly covered previously. And in the, in the expanded notes version of this, um, I get into a little bit more detail about that and some of the elements I already raised. That seems like a such a anticlimactic way to end this discussion. So I want to again end with the idea that the goal of this for Moltmann is not to be speculative. It's not to dismiss the evangelical concerns. It's not to somehow make it so that he can defend his universalism, but it really is all about God reflecting God's vision of the future as one that is in the fullness of love, the fullness of promise fulfilled, and in every way celebrating the work of God's vision for a restored and reconciled humanity that it can, can exist in eternal celebratory communion.